You're listening to a presentation of The Rising. We're a real church for real people where you can belong before you believe. We're always honored to hear how God is working in your life through this ministry. If you have a story you'd like to share with us, hit us up at wearetherising.com or on Facebook or Instagram. Finally, if you'd like to invest in what God's doing through this church, you can always give online through our site. Thanks again for tuning in and get ready. Lean forward with an expectant attitude to hear a message from God's Word. Well, on November 22nd, 1963, Americans were shocked by the real-time live announcement that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And in 1969, over 700 million people marveled over the announcement and the video footage of the first lunar landing by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And then in 1995, our country erupted in shouts of joy and uh, responses of disbelief from the O.J. Simpson verdict that was announced. On September 11, 2001, the entire world was rocked with the announcement that four planes were hijacked, one of them crashing in a field in Pennsylvania, another crashing into the Pentagon, and two other planes crashing into the two towers of the World Trade Center. See, history is filled with announcements like these that rock and shock and alter our world. It's announcements like the assassination of of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the death of Princess Diana, the death of Tupac and Biggie, the capture of Saddam Hussein, the execution of Osama bin Laden, the election of Barack Obama as the first ever African-American president for the United States, the 33 Chilean miners who were freed after being trapped underground for 69 days, and the arrival of the iPhone. Right? See, history is filled with announcements that rock, shock, and alter our world. And some of these announcements mean the world to you. Some of these announcements don't mean so much to you. But there are some announcements that have taken place in your life that change your world. They may not change the world, but they change your world. And these announcements were heard by millions, but they were heard maybe just by you or by a group of people. It was the announcement that he made when he got down on one knee and proclaimed that he wanted to live the rest of his life with you. And he asked you, will you marry me? It was the announcement that you gave when you said, yes, I will, or, what are you thinking? No. (laughs) It's the announcement that came when your parents sat you down, and they said, mommy and daddy love you very much, but we're getting a divorce. These are announcements that shape and change our world. It's the announcement you received from the college when they sent you the acceptance letter, or when they sent you the rejection letter. It's the announcement that you heard when your wife said, honey, guess what? We're having a baby. It's when the mechanic said, yep, it's the transmission. It's when the doctor called to say, I want to tell you about the cells that we took for the biopsy. They're cancer free. Announcements like this shape and rock our world, right? And there's this one announcement that I want to preach on today. And this is the, the, the announcement that, that changes everything in history. It's not an announcement that was announced to kings and queens or prophets and, and priests, but it was an announcement that was announced to, to just one person. And this announcement is the one that changes all of history. It changes your life, and it impacts everything once it's made. We're starting this series today called Finding Jesus, and, um, and I love this series for this season because it, I feel like during the Christmas season, um, we get so distracted and sidetracked with all the things that are going on, and, it, and it's also during the season that I hear people complain about how busy they are, right? Like, like in this season, we complain about how busy it is, and we're like ready for the season to be done before Christmas even comes. I think the reason is because we anticipate this season so much that we start celebrating it in October, so that by mid-December, we're done with Christmas, right? And so I, I have a suggestion. What if, what if we started celebrating Christmas after Thanksgiving, right? Then we wouldn't be ready for it to be over because so many people are like, oh, I can't wait for it to be done. Let's just wait to celebrate it it's after Thanksgiving. You with me? Two of you, three of you are, yes. So uh, we're in this season, right? And, and it's so easy for us to get distracted and sidetracked with, with the decorations and the Christmas parties and the, and the presents and the lights and the time with family. And all of that's great. All of that's amazing. But because we have so much going on, it's often easy for us, it's easy for me, to miss Jesus, who's the reason for the season in the first place. Like, I can get so caught up in Christmas that I miss Jesus, 
And so we're starting this series, Finding Jesus, because I want to look at this year and say no more. Like no more. Sure, we missed Jesus last year and the year before, and we got caught up in all that other stuff. But this season, we want to find Jesus. And so as we go on this journey to find Jesus, I'm going to preach from three different uh, points. Uh, Today, I'm going to talk to you about the announcement of the birth of Jesus. Next week, we're going to talk about the journey that Mary and Joseph had to take for Jesus to be born. And then on Christmas Eve, by the way, I hope you're uh, planning on being here for Christmas Eve, five and seven here at the Norva. It's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. Three of you are going to be here. This is going to be a disaster. Okay. Okay. Christmas Eve, one of the best times for you to bring people who never come to church. You say, you've got to come sit with me Christmas Eve. And listen, I don't care if you have traditions of going and seeing Granny and eating ham. Great and awesome. Tell Granny we'll be there an hour late. The ham can wait. Only one person is going to make a new tradition. You say, this is just too important. Because it's great, it's amazing, it's awesome. We're going to spend time with family, and that's fun. But don't miss Jesus this season. Make sure you're here Christmas Eve, 5, 7 o'clock. You bring some people. We got a balcony to fill. Come on, we got people to reach. We got a mission to keep. Are y'all with me? We're not going to do it if it's just me. So, Christmas Eve, I'm going to preach on the arrival. The arrival, here comes heaven. The arrival, Christmas Eve. You make sure you're here. But first, I need to preach on the announcement. And before we get to the announcement that I want to tell you about, I need to talk about another announcement that took place Uh, in the very beginning. See, the the Bible begins with the book of Genesis, and uh, Genesis starts off talking about how God created all things. God spoke all things into existence, and he creates Adam and Eve, the, the first people. He creates humanity in his image so that they could be in relationship with him. And this is critical for us to, to, to understand. God created you so that you could be in relationship with him, Right? And see, it's only with God that we can experience life to the full, because he's the author of life. He's the one who created life. He knows how life should be done. So he creates humanity to be in relationship with him. And we see this in the very first chapters of Genesis, that that Adam and Eve are with God. God walks with them in the cool of the day, and he talks with them, and they have this relationship with God. But then comes Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, sin enters into the world And it destroys all things. And you and I, we we know what sin is. We've experienced it in our life. I mean, sin is everything we regret. Sin is everything we're ashamed of. Sin is everything uh, that that we look back and we say, I I wish I hadn't have done that. Sin is, is, is what comes into the picture and it distorts all the good that God has made. And what sin does is it separates us from a good and holy, perfect God who can have nothing to do with sin. So in Genesis chapter 3, the way sin enters in is Eve is hanging out by this tree that God told Adam and Eve not to eat from. So there's a problem right there. She's hanging out by this tree. She's close to it. And as she's close to this tree, uh, the devil, Satan, our enemy, appears to her in the form of a serpent. And he begins to tempt Eve. She sees how good the tree is, how, 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 how good it looks and how tasty it might be. But then Satan tempts her with pride. He tempts her with power. He says, oh, see, the the reason why God doesn't want you to eat from this tree is because he knows that when you do, you'll become like him. And God doesn't want to have any competition. You and I, we get tempted with pride and power oftentimes in our life. This is what happens with Eve. She's standing too too close to the tree. But by the way, you need to set some boundaries in your life so that you're not close to that thing that can bring about your downfall. She's too close to the tree. So she sees the fruit and she says, okay, I'll eat it. And when she does this, she rebels against God. Because God gives Adam and Eve a choice to love him. He says, here's this tree, I don't want you to eat from it. And the reason why God does this is not because he cares about the fruit, it's not because he cares about the tree, but he wants to give Adam and Eve a choice to love him. See, love is love when it's a choice. Love is not love when you're obligated to love. Love is not love when you have no choice not to love. So God gives Adam and Eve, God gives you and I this same choice. Will we love him or not? Will we follow him or not? It's like if I tell my son, hey, come give me a hug, eh, okay. But it's when my son runs up to me and embraces me and says, Daddy, I love you, without being prompted, oh, that's when my heart melts. So God gives Adam and Eve this choice. Will you follow me or not? The choice is in the tree. What will you do with the tree? And what Eve does, because she's tempted, she looks at it, 
and indulges in that moment she rebels against God. She brings Adam along with her, and he makes the choice to rebel against God. And here's the thing, you and I, we've made the choice too. We make the choice every single day. Will we choose God or not? Will we follow God or not? We make this decision in all sorts of areas in our life. And when we choose to rebel against God, that's when sin enters in and it separates us from God in that area, in, in our whole life. And so what happens is in Genesis chapter 3, humanity is separated from God. This is a problem because God is the author of life. God is the one who created us. He knows how life should be lived. And it's only through God that we can live life to the fullest. So we got a problem. And in Genesis chapter 3, God lines up Adam and Eve, and he gets a serpent there too. It's like his kids, they've done something bad, and he's about to lay into them and let them know what the consequences are for their actions. Because there's always consequences to sin. But he talks to the serpent first, and here's what God says to the serpent, and we find in the consequence that God gives to the serpent the announcement that foreshadows the big announcement. Genesis 3, 14 says, Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you're cursed. More than all animals, domestic and wild, you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. There it is. There's the announcement. God says to the serpent, because of what you've done, there's going to be hostility between you and people. And there's so much packed into this announcement that God makes. There's going to be this hostility between you and people. Some of you don't like snakes. Yeah, I get it. But, but beyond that, God is talking more about humanity and Satan, humanity and the devil. There's this war that we have. There's this war that you feel in your life where you know what you want to do, but you don't do it. And what you don't want to do, that's what you keep on doing. There's this war. Like, I want to follow God, but there's this thing pulling at me. Like, I don't, where I don't follow him, there's this war going on between us. And God says, but, but the offspring of woman, Jesus was born of a virgin, will come. And he says, he will strike your head. He'll deliver a death blow to the serpent. He'll deliver a, a, a death blow to Satan. He says, you will strike his heel. We see right here in Genesis chapter 3, this glimmer of hope that God gives for all of humanity. He says, there's going to come one who you're going to strike his heel. Jesus was born. He lived a perfect life, a life we can't live. And then Jesus died the death we deserve. It was on the cross as he was being crucified. I imagine Satan looked at him and said, look at that, I win. Because Jesus died on the cross. But God said to Satan, you'll strike his heel. He's going to recover from that. Because after Jesus was crucified on the cross, he was buried. But three days later, he rose again from the dead. Three days later, he conquered the grave. Three days later, he walked out victorious, saying, hell can't hold me, and death can't stop me. You'll strike his heel. You'll think you delivered a death blow, but no, he will deliver the death blow to you. And this is what Jesus does. He delivers a death blow to the one who brought sin in, so that through Jesus, we can be healed, we can be forgiven, we can be made right with God. This is the announcement God gives in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, there's going to be one to come who's going to make all things right. And then 730 years before Jesus would ever be born, there was this prophecy that was given by Isaiah the prophet, this guy who spoke on behalf of God. Here's what Isaiah said. All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and we'll call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Isaiah gives this dual prophecy here. He's prophesying about the time that he's living in, but he's also talking about this day that's going to come where this virgin, the word that he uses for virgin can be translated in two different ways, this young woman and virgin. In the time of Isaiah, this prophecy was fulfilled because a young woman gave birth to show the king at the time this is what's going to happen. But then 730 years later, a virgin gave birth to a son and then also 730 years before Jesus was born, Micah, the prophet, proclaimed this. He said, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins 
or in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. What Micah says 730 years before Jesus would ever be born is that this is the town where he's going to be born. He says that his origins are from the distant past. As we read through the scriptures, what we see is that Jesus was with God in the beginning of creation. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Micah says there's this one who has origins from the distant past, from all of creation, who will come to redeem the world. There's actually over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament of the scriptures that refer to the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Over 300 prophecies are announced about this Savior who's going to come. And this is great. This is amazing because Jesus fulfills these prophecies. And it wasn't like when Jesus was born, like he made a list of all these prophecies and said, okay, here's my bucket list. I need to check these off. No. Like there were some, some of these prophecies Jesus couldn't fulfill on his own unless he was God and unless he orchestrated it happening that way. See, the over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfills is just further evidence that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was the son of God. And so this brings us to, to where we are now, the announcement of announcements, the announcement that changes everything. And what's amazing to me is that this announcement isn't made to kings and queens, to priests and prophets. This announcement isn't even made to millions of people, but this announcement is made to one teenage girl in the 400 person population town of Nazareth. And this announcement changes everything. This announcement impacts you, it impacts me. It shifts the world forever. Here's, here's the announcement that's made, Luke chapter one, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, like you are when an angel talks to you. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid Mary, the angel told her, for you found favor with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son, and you'll name him Jesus. He'll be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, well, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, well, oh, yeah, it makes sense. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he'll be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. And Mary responded, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. Then the angel left her. And there it is. There's the announcement. This is the announcement that changes everything. The announcement of the birth of a savior. And it's made to this, this teenage girl. Here, let's, let's put us in the scene so we can see what it means. A Gabriel, the angel, shows up to Mary, who, who most, most likely she's 13 or 14 years old. Right? Be because back then in, the, in this Greek and Roman culture, girls were often married at a, at a young age. And so she's engaged to be married to Joseph. Most likely she's 13, 14 years old. And this angel shows up and says, hey, Mary, I got some great news for you. You're going to give birth to the Son of God. And it seems like great and amazing news, but Mary hears that and she has a question. And you can see the conversation she has with the angel, right? Gabriel, that, that's awesome. That, that's, I'm going to become pregnant. That's awesome. But how's that going to happen? Because I've been going to health class, and I figured out how babies come about. See, I used to think that storks brought the babies, but storks don't bring the babies. What I learned in health class is that babies come about when the man puts a, Mary, 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 I know, I know how, I know how babies come about. You don't have to explain it to me. Okay, well, I was just wondering. I was trying to help you out because it seemed like you didn't really know because, you know, I'm Madonna like a virgin, and I've never done what it takes to get a baby. So how is that going to happen? Mary, I know how babies are going to happen. You're just going to 
have this baby, and so that's how it's going to work. Okay, right. And so you keep saying that, but you said he's the son of God. And again, I know how babies happen. So does that mean that God's going to, no, 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 God is not going to, that's not going to happen, Mary. Don't even think about that. You're just going to be pregnant. That's it. Like, there's going to be a baby in you. Don't think too deeply about it. That's just how it's going to work. And here's the great and amazing thing. See, this is going to be a miracle birth. I mean, your, your relative Elizabeth, like, she's old, like, old, old dusty old. And people thought she couldn't have a baby, but now she's having a baby. It's a miracle birth. And how much more this birth from a virgin? See, people are only going to be able to say, oh, if this is real, then it's from God. And Mary says, okay, whatever you say, I'm down for the ride. And, and here's, a, here's this, what's amazing to me about this. Mary says yes to having the Son of God, knowing this is going to wreck her life. This announcement that's made to her sounds like great and amazing news. How awesome is it? Mary, did you know? Yeah, I knew because the angel told me. But this announcement wrecks Mary's life because she has to tell Joseph, She's pregnant because the angel didn't tell Joseph at the time. Imagine the angel went back up to God. I mean, you can see how the conversation went, right? He goes up to God and he's like, God, I told, I told her it's all good. And God says, great. What did Mary and Joseph think? And the angel's like, wait, Joseph? And God's like, yeah, you did tell Joseph, didn't you? He needs to know. And the angel's like, I'll, I'll be right back, right? The angel just shows up to Mary, and so Mary says, yes, I'll, I'll bear the Son of God, but now i got to tell this guy I'm engaged to because he's going to figure it out pretty quick. You can't hide a pregnancy very long. After a while, people are going to start looking at her talking about, are you pregnant or just eating a lot of tacos? Which is it? You can't hide that. So you can imagine that she tells Joseph. She sits him down, hey, Joseph, got something to tell you. Got some news for you. You doing all right first? I just want to make sure you're good. You had a good meal. You liked that meal that I cooked you, didn't you? It was good tacos, weren't they? Yeah, they were real nice. And that you're sitting in your favorite chair. That's a good chair, nice and comfy. Hey, you know what? I was talking to your boss uh, at the carpentry shop, and he said, you're doing a phenomenal job. He wants to give you a raise, and I'm pregnant. And I was thinking it would be a really good idea if we went to the Bahamas for our honeymoon. That would be really cool, don't you think? I mean, how do you, how do you tell? So she has to tell Joseph I'm pregnant, and Joseph he went to health class too. He's like, wait, hold on. I wasn't there for that. So he decides, I'm done with you. I'm leaving you. This is, this is what Matthew records in his gospel. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. No, but Joseph, you don't understand. An angel showed up to me. This is God's baby. Okay, sure it is, Mary. I'll see you later. But as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, I should have talked to you and Mary together, but I'm here now. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She'll have a son, and you're to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Now Joseph is convinced. But that's it. You got Mary and Joseph against the world. Because people are looking, and they're saying, oh, they're going to get engaged. That's so awesome. But then they get married, and four months later, Mary's having a baby. And people start doing the math. They're like, hold on now, babies don't come. I went to health class and babies don't come that quick. This baby came about in some illegitimate terms here. This isn't quite right. See, back then in that culture, not so much in this culture, but in that culture, uh, people saved sex for marriage. And that's not a cultural thing, it's actually a God thing. See, if you're a Christian following Jesus, God has called you to pursue purity in your sexuality. And so as a Christian, you set boundaries saying, I'm going to save sex for the sanctity of marriage. See, it's not a cultural thing. It's a God thing. 
But back then in their culture, when they saw that uh, someone had sex before marriage or got pregnant out of wedlock, like that couple was shunned. They, they were outcasts. They were looked down upon. Mary speaks to the angel and she says, yes, angel, I will do whatever you say. I am the Lord's servant, knowing she's going to have a hard time trying to convince Joseph. But Mary and Joseph now know why, because an angel spoke to them, and then they go to tell their relatives, oh, hey, by the way, this isn't Joseph's baby, but it's from God, and an angel told us. Okay, Mary and Joseph, whatever you say. Mary and Joseph, because of the birth of Jesus, are disowned by their family. They're outcasts. They're shunned. Why do you think they give birth to Jesus in a barn? Because they go to Bethlehem, David's hometown, and there's no room for them. None of his family will take them in. They've outcast them. They've shunned them. They said, we don't want anything to do with you, so they're forced to give birth in a barn. This is what it meant for Mary to carry Jesus. Hardship. Sacrifice. Toil. Why do we think when we start following Jesus, everything's going to be great with a cherry on top? No. No. Mary says, I'll carry carry the baby no matter what the cost. I'll do whatever it takes, no matter the cost. And this is what they experience, hardship. Their life is forever changed. I mean, think about the scenario. Mary has to tell Joseph, he doesn't believe her, he wants to leave her. Then he's convinced because an angel shows up. Thank God for that angel. And then comes her wedding day. She can't fit into the dress like she had always hoped and dreamed. Her wedding isn't uh, as as populated as she hoped it would be because they've been shunned and outcast by her family. They have no place to stay when they go to Bethlehem. And then Jesus. Jesus is born with a, a soiled reputation. Jesus is born and people are thinking he's a bastard because they weren't married when they got. Do you see how great the grace of God is? Why would God choose a situation like that to be born into? Because if I was going to choose for my son to be born, I'd choose for him to be born in a palace. If I were God and I was choosing when I'd be born, I'd be choosing to be born now where there's AC and heat and indoor plumbing. If I was God, I wouldn't have chose this. But God chooses to make his appearance to earth through this poor teenage girl, this couple that's going to be shunned and outcast. He chooses to make his appearance in a circumstance that seems questionable, where his reputation is soiled from birth and people are looking at him like, oh yeah, that's an illegitimate child. He chooses to be born in a manger, be born in a barn and place. Why would God choose circumstances like that? So that he could stand with you and all your hardships and all your shortcomings and all your trials and all your difficulties and say, I get it. Same here. The God we serve is not some distant God who's cut off and says, you serve me, whatever. No, the God we serve is one who comes near and says, I'm relatable. Because I was a refugee running for my life. I was born in poverty. I was born in squalor. I was born with a short deck, with a, with a bad hand dealt to me. I was born, I lived it. And because of that, God can stand with you in your brokenness and say, same here. Your home was broken, I get it. You grew up with not all the amenities of life, same here, I get it. You have people talk bad about you, same here. This is how great the grace of God is. This is how relatable God is, that he was born in this circumstance so that he could stand with us and say, same here. My hope today is that you see just how much God loves you, that he allowed himself to be born in that situation so that he could stand with you today. And if you have this image of a tyrant God who's displeased with you, my hope is that it would change today as you look at the birth of the Savior because of the circumstances he allowed himself to be born into family that would be shunned and outcast. And so Mary has given this announcement, you're going to carry the Son of God in you. 
But as we dig deep, we see there's some difficulty with this announcement. There's some difficulty that comes with carrying the Son of God. But Mary says, I'll rise up to the challenge no matter what. And imagine all the difficulty and hardship that Mary must have faced, the ridicule that she faced, the loneliness she must have faced. And all of it, in all of it, I imagine that night as Jesus was born and she held him in her arms, she would have said, I would go through it all again just so I could have Jesus. I would put up with anything. I would go through all of it again just so I could have Jesus. And my hope is this morning you would be at that place in your life where you would say, it doesn't matter what happens to me, it doesn't matter what comes my way, it doesn't matter what hardships I face, what trials I have to go through, as long as I have Jesus, that's all that matters to me. That's all I need. That's all I need. I want to make an announcement to you this morning, just like the angel made an announcement to Mary 2,000 years ago. And it's that there's one who has come to bring you life. The announcement is that there's one who's come to bring you life. That there's one who's come to redeem you and restore you and resurrect you. See, in Jesus is the hope that you long for. In Jesus is the joy that you desire. In Jesus is the peace that you so want. There's one who's come. And he's available to you today. And my hope is that if you haven't chosen to carry Jesus with you, you would do that today. But I want to warn you, if you choose to carry Jesus, there's going to be some hardships that come. There's going to be some difficulties that come your way. See, your life is not going to look like what you think it might look like. If you choose to carry Jesus, you're going to be different from other people around you, and they might not understand that because you're living for someone else. You're living for a higher calling. If you choose to carry Jesus, you'll find that you won't want to engage in sin like you used to because God's spirit will be living in you, leading you and equipping you to say no to that so that you can find victory. You'll discover if you choose to carry Jesus that you'll need to surrender all of you because this Savior doesn't want to just put up a nice new veneer on you. He wants to completely crucify the old you and raise up a brand new you. Everything changes if you choose to carry Jesus. If you choose to carry Jesus, there'll be a reordering of your priorities that needs to take place, a revolutionary shift in your thinking because this Savior that was born 2,000 years ago is inviting you to be reborn anew in Him. See, Jesus wants to birth all new possibilities, birth all new outcomes, birth all new experiences in you. If you carry this Savior like Mary carried this Savior, then things aren't going to be the way you thought they were going to be. And it may be difficult because God requires a change in you, but it's for the good. It's for the best. Everything you long for is found in Jesus, but you have to choose, like Mary chose, to carry him with you. What I'm talking about goes beyond just belief. What I'm talking about is saying, Jesus, I believe that you died for me on the cross. You rose again from the dead, and because of that, I want to carry you in my life. I want to make you the leader of my life and give you everything. So I want to ask you this morning, have you made the decision to carry Jesus in your life? If we're going to find Jesus this season, we got to first say yes to him. And I want to ask you this morning if you're willing to say yes to him. I'm not asking you if you said a prayer one time. I'm not asking you if you raised your hand in a church service one time. I'm not asking you if you went through a confirmation class or you were even raised in a Christian home. Here's what I'm asking you. Have you chosen to carry the Savior with you? Have you chosen to say, Jesus, I believe that you died for me on the cross and you rose again from the dead. And because of that, I want to give you my life. I want to follow you and I want to be baptized into you. If you've never made the decision to say yes to Jesus by believing, following, and being baptized into him, I want to invite you to decide to do that today. Don't leave without making that decision. 
We're actually going to do baptisms on Christmas Eve. And I don't want you to miss your chance. So if you've never made the decision, today's the day. Here's how you let us know you made that decision. On the note card that's on your seat, you just check the box on it that says, I want to know more about baptism. That lets us know you're saying, hey, I believe. I don't want to follow Jesus. Now I want to go all in by being baptized into him. You mark that box. You fill out that card. Drop it off at the black tables. We'd love to talk to you and get you ready to be baptized on Christmas Eve. If for some reason you're going to be out of town, you can't make it then, which you, you should just change your plans and be here. Um, then we'll talk to you about getting baptized in January. But today's the day. The angel showed up to Gabriel and said, hey, you got an option to carry Jesus, will you? And she said, I'm your servant. I'll do it. And some of you, some of you, you've made the decision to follow Jesus. You've said yes to him. But if we're being open, you're not really carrying him with you. You're not carrying him with you in some areas of your life, some arenas in your life. There's that sin that you go back to over and over again and you hope nobody will ever find out. Today's the day to lay it down and to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. If you're a Christian, you've, been, you've said yes to Jesus, but you haven't been following him. Today's the day, and this is what we're going to celebrate in communion. See, in communion, what we do is we remind ourselves of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Members from our team are going to come down. They're going to pass out trays, and in those trays are stacks of cups. And I want to invite you as a tray passes you by to take a stack and let it be a reminder for you of the resurrection, the death of Jesus. The bottom cup has some bread. It's there to remind us of his body that was broken for us. The top cup has some juice. that's there to remind us of his blood that was shed for us. And at any time as we sing... Feel free to take communion, but also let this be a time where you say, God, I'm tired of playing games. I'm coming back to you. I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to trust you in my family. I'm going to trust you in my emotions. I'm going to trust you in my finances. I'm going to trust you in my relationships. I'm going to trust you in everything because I want to carry you with me everywhere I go. So that's the announcement that changes everything that a Savior is coming. Next week, we're going to talk about the journey that Mary and Joseph had to take for Jesus to be born. And on Christmas Eve, we're covering the arrival. And here's what I want to promise you. When we talk about the arrival of Jesus, I'm going to present the gospel so clearly for people who are here to make a decision to follow Jesus. And so here's what I'll promise you. I'll do what you can't do by presenting the gospel in a great way. And maybe you can do that. I promise to do that if you promise to do what I can't do, which is bring your friends, bring your coworkers, bring people in your family to hear about the hope that they need. I can't bring your friend. I can't bring the person you work with. I can't bring the person that you sit with at school. But you can because you know them. See, we have heard about an announcement about a Savior who makes all things new. I've announced it to you. Who will you announce it to this week? By saying, come and see. Come sit with me. Because I want to help you find Jesus. Thanks so much for listening. We pray God inspires, challenges, and motivates you to become greater through what you've just heard. Again, be sure to check us out at wearetherising.com. Remember, your best days are still ahead.